With that, I am now happy to call the 112th annual business meeting to order. I'd like to introduce the members of the ACSA Board of Directors. If you're in the audience, please turn on your cameras and we'll attempt to spotlight you on the screen. Uh, first Vice President and President-elect Kathy Hoshar from University of Hawaii at Manoa. Second Vice President uh, Jose Gomez, University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Past President Sharon Har, University of Michigan. Secretary Treasurer Peter Robinson, Cornell University. At-Large Director Catherine Hamill, University of Calgary. At-Large Director Kwesi Daniels, Tuskegee University. At-Large Director Shelby Doyle, Iowa State University. At-Large Director Marcelo Lopez Donardi, Texas A&M University. At-Large Director Joshua Foster, East Los Angeles College. And Public Director Martha Campbell, RMI. Student Director Julia Andor, Vice President of the AIA, American Institute of Architecture Students. And Executive Director Michael Monti, ACSA. As Mike is celebrating, we are celebrating Mike's 20 years uh, as Executive Director of ACSA. So I'd like everybody to give Mike a huge round of virtual applause. If you were in Vancouver, we did celebrate Mike's 20 years, but we'd like to celebrate him again. And this is also our last opportunity to publicly thank five of our board members whose terms are ending this year. So can we also give a big virtual applause for student director, Julia Andor, uh, at-large director, Catherine Hamill, at-large director, Kwesi Daniels, public director, Martha Campbell, and past president, Sharon Haar. Give all of your thumbs up and lots of clapping, virtual clapping. So thank you all for your board service. And there's Mike, <laughs> a spotlight on Mike. Now we're gonna move to our future directors. Uh, thank you to everyone who voted in this year's board elections. I'd like to introduce uh -huh. the incoming board members of the 2024-2025 ACSA board, student director, uh, Gilberto Loz uh, Lozada Baez, University de Mo Monterrey, Mexico. At large director, at large director uh, Dahlia Endum, Howard University. At large director Vivian Lee, University of Toronto. Second vice president June Williamson, City College of New York, who will be your 2026-2027 ACSA president. You can only hear me clapping. Thank you. I see a few virtual hands clapping. Thanks. This year, ACSA also conducted a search for our new public director. During our March 17-18 uh, uh, board meeting, we voted to appoint this person and are now in the process of confirming their acceptance of the appointment. For this reason, we will not announce the next public director, but we'll do so in a future Friday ACSA update email. Next, I'd like to introduce our current Secretary Treasurer, Peter Robinson, who will take us through the process of identifying member schools officially represented at this meeting. So, Peter. Good evening, everyone. The list on our screen shows all the members schools that have registered or pre-registered as of 9 a.m. this morning. If your school or if you are not listed on this list, Please identify yourself in our chat. Thank you. Okay. So thanks, Peter. At each annual business meeting, the president reviews the year and the state of the association. Last week, we finished our final board meeting, board of directors meeting for the 2023-2024 academic year. And we walked away from that meeting both inspired and a little daunted by what we see architectural educators facing. Many academic routines have fully returned past uh, post COVID, our board agreed. Yet we also believe schools are facing increasingly complex challenges that are the result of factors at work inside architecture, as well as external factors that are affecting higher education and our discipline. Some of these issues are the result of internal contradictions that for a long time, we did not notice or could conveniently defer addressing. And still some of these issues are intertwined to such a point that unraveling them causes us to wonder whether there was a trusted core or center. 
In my invitation to faculty this week, I listed these issues, these as issues that schools are facing and that because of these reasons, you should attend the business meeting. And here they are. I expect one of these is familiar to you and that you can add a half dozen more that you and your faculty uh, and your students are discussing. Well, we obviously are not gonna solve all of these in a sig sig single business meeting, but I included them to demonstrate to you that we as an organization are fully engaged in issues of serious importance. Much of what I have to report tonight aims to help address many of these items. I also included this list because we hope that you feel the same way we do. That is that you feel that addressing these issues is part of our collective mission as educators. Fundamentally, education is an optimistic endeavor intended to help people to improve their lives and to improve the lives of others, particularly people who are vulnerable or powerless. With so much facing us that is complicated and unclear, we hope that you and your colleagues feel that ACSA can be the place where we find common cause and opportunities to contribute and to collaborate. Two years ago, ACSA finished a strategic planning process that yielded a set of goals and objectives to guide the organization from July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2025. This year was the second year of the cycle, and one of the merits of our strategic planning process was that it allows us to focus our strategies that cut across the goals and objectives. With our strategic plan, the board set two thematic priorities for the three-year period. Uh, one, supporting climate action within architectural education, and two, increasing racial and social equity in architectural education. I'm grateful to Sharon Har for setting the stage for this work in year one, and this year we have tried to maintain continuity in these priorities. As you'll hear from Kathy Hoshar in the President-Elect's report, these themes will continue next year. But no strategic plan is comprehensive or anticipates changes in the organization's environment. This year we had some changes in our environment. The funding of NAB is one of those issues. Now, I'm not going to review the details of the NAB discussion here. There are plenty of recorded webinars on ACSA's website that you can review. And NAB's funding was not a new issue that just arose on the ACSA Board of Directors radar. We began discussions with NAB in 2022 about a funding agreement that was due to expire at the end of the year. The discussions carry on at a slow pace among the organizations that constitute and are the primary funders of NAB which are ACSA, AIA, AIAS, and NCARB. I reported to our members in a webinar on October 26 and at the November Administrators Conference that there had been no apparent change in NAB's position that it required a nearly 50% increase in funding. On January 9th, NAB sent a message to the schools that it accredits announcing their intention to charge direct fees to schools for accreditation. The fee model they presented assumed that no additional funding for accreditation would come from other sources. Because that announcement came abruptly and during a time when we thought the five organizations were still working with the facilitator as a group to find a solution, the ACSA board determined that negotiations had reached a dead end. We called a special business meeting on January 22nd and introduced a resolution that included a vote of no confidence. The decision to issue this resolution was the result of more than 18 months of negotiations that happened largely out of view. The model NAB published on January 9th would more than triple the financial burden put on schools for funding of NAB because NAB explained at that time, AIA and NCARB were still exploring the level of their potential future contributions to NAB. As I said at the beginning of our February 28th member caucuses, the reaction to NAB's January 9th announcement and to ACSA's January 26th, 22nd resolution was strong, to say the least. Many people were shocked about NAB's announcement, about ACSA's response, and about what was perceived to be an inability among the five organizations to come to an agreement. Many people contacted me as ACSA president, and I know that many conversations happened within faculties at our member schools and between colleagues. I announced in a letter to the membership on February 5th that ACSA does not want to end accreditation, nor do we want to see the end of NAB as the accrediting body. I said that we would like to restart the talks among NAB stakeholders with an aim to find at least a short-term solution. In the weeks since the beginning of February, we have seen a cooling off period among the organizations. AIA and NCAR both released statements affirming the importance of accreditation and signaling that they would not withdraw their support. ACSA and NAB both mutually agreed to postpone their pending actions. For ACSA, this was a postponement of a vote on the resolution we introduced in January. For NAB, this was a postponement of the public comment period on the proposal, proposed fees. 
In the last several weeks, another significant step has gotten underway. AIA and NCARB called for a third-party audit of NAB as a condition of any future funding for NAB's accreditation activities. They invited ACSA and AIS to participate in the audit, and we both agreed readily. So the audit will proceed between now and early May. We cannot say more about this process as it's just at the beginning. We're hopeful that following this audit, we will make substantial progress in forging a long-term agreement for funding of NAB that serves everyone. Again, I wanna say clearly that ACSA values accreditation and having an organization that is co-constituted by the profession's major stakeholders, AIA representing practitioners, AIAS representing students, NCARB representing regulators and ACSA representing educators. In the last four weeks, we have held two discussion sessions with our members, the February 28 caucuses and an ACSA sponsored lunch at the annual meeting in Vancouver. During those sessions, we asked our members to reflect on and share their perspectives on a number of issues. The slide on the screen shows some of the highlights of these discussions. It's significant that ACSA's full and candidate members continue to voice their support for having accreditation. Faculty from different schools have reasons for wanting to preserve NAB and for suggesting ways to streamline the accreditation process. We put some of, of the major outcomes from these discussions here, although there are many more issues from our notes that we cannot fit on the slide to cover sufficiently this evening. I wanna reiterate, however, that uh, consistent across our members is a view that accreditation must be right-sized to fit the needs of a diverse array of institutions with professional programs. By right-sized, we mean there must be an appropriate balance between cost and value to the program. Many schools express concern that the shift to an assessment-based accreditation model has gone overboard. They say that assessment is not the point of architectural education. Others see more value in assessment, but nonetheless do not agree that there should be more staff and more direct costs to fund NAB. Accreditation costs are ultimately borne by students because any additional money to fund NAB or to earn accreditation are resources that cannot go to students. So to sum up our NAB update, I'll bring back the, sl the slide listing the key issues we see for these NAB funding discussions. We're cautiously optimistic that the organizations can reach a long-term funding agreement. ACSA continues to seek to address these key issues that we can focus on other pressing issues, which takes us to our next change in the strategic climate facing architecture schools. This one is complex and intertwined Beginning in the fall, NAB, uh, NCARB announced its Pathways to Practice initiative, through which it is advocating that states adopt a, quote, many paths, one goal approach to architectural licensing by recognizing multiple combinations of experience and examination with or without various iterations of higher education as sufficient qualifiers. In its explanations, NCARB talks about eliminating unnecessary barriers, reducing licensure, candidates' costs and improving access to the profession for traditionally underrepresented groups. We encourage you to review NCARB's statements about this initiative. The Architects newspaper published an opinion piece by NCARB's president, which the leaders of ACSA and NAB responded to, as did Tom Fisher from the University of Minnesota. So we hope that you will read our responses to NCARB's piece as well as NAB's and Tom's. From ACSA's perspective, NCARB's Pathways to Practice initiative is a significant challenge to all of our members. Regardless of which degree your program might offer, from associates to doctorate of architecture, accredited or non-accredited, education is categorized as an unnecessary barrier that can be overcome, apparently, by extending the amount of supervised practice that a licensure candidate can obtain. There are two dimensions of this that I'd like to underscore because I think for many people this announcement was seen as a positive move. First, the argument is made that eliminating the education requirement improves access to the profession for traditionally underrepresented people. The assumption is that a substantial number of people are excluded from licensure, although NCARB says from the profession, which is different, because they cannot offer uh, afford higher education. Eliminating the need for any education beyond high school provides equal access to licensure for those who can get a job and pass the architecture registration exam. From our perspective, this argument has implicit assumptions and consequences. Equality is not the same as equity. In a state that does not require higher education for licensure, individuals with high school degrees have equal opportunity only when one assumes that everyone starts their 
post high school life from the same place. NCARB's policy position ignores decades of discrimination against women in the workplace, race-based job discrimination, and the need for cultural assimilation in order to find success. The solution to a lack of diversity among licensed architects is not simply treating education as a barrier. As we say in our response, encouraging people who have been historically excluded from quality education to forego the education that their predecessors worked so hard to obtain is regressive. Second, eliminating higher education as a requirement for licensure will erode the relevance and respected standing of architecture as a profession. The design, construction, and stewardship of the built environment is getting more complex and requires more knowledge than ever before. This is because architecture is tightly connected with both the sciences and humanities, which continually expand over time to greater and greater levels of interconnected understanding. ACSA's position is that higher education provides knowledge that is essential to architects' continued relevance. Ar architects are more than building technicians. We are recognized as a profession because our knowledge and skills can contribute to society's greatest challenges, from reducing carbon to improving human health. I will return to this point in a minute. Before I do, I wanna make clear that we cannot simply reject NCARP's position out of hand. Rather, this is an issue that all of us in higher education must come together to sort out. Architectural education is developed with many longstanding hierarchical assumptions that are being unraveled in ways that frankly reveal that some of the trusted foundations of architectural education have begun to crumble. We as the, a collective of schools at every level of post-secondary education must continue to discuss ways to better understand the value of a continuum of higher education in architecture, beginning with community colleges and polytechnic colleges as they're referred to in Canada and extending to bachelor's, master's and doctoral education. More clarity and transparency about what students can achieve and expect in the way of employment and advancement at each level of education is the best way to serve everyone who thinks they would like to work in architecture or in any of the related fields. We are sorely lacking in data on outcomes for graduates of higher education programs, and we do not know about the employment and compensation outcomes for the estimated 15% of licensed architects that NCARB says earn their license without a NAB accredited degree. Now let me return to the point I made before about the relevance of architecture as a profession. There's one more assumption to NCARB's argument that needs a lot more unpacking, and that is that firms are capable of substituting for architecture schools and exposing students to the full scope of knowledge about architecture and the built environment. We do not doubt that there are many firms with robust employee development programs and ample supports to help their associates work for four years or more to compensate for the lack of higher education but we do not currently have a sound means of ensuring that architectural experience is comparable to higher education in ensuring the quality of would-be architects. The Architecture Experience and Program, or AXP, has no NAB equivalent. Finally, all of this potential for firms to take on the work of universities is predicated on ample opportunities for everybody to find a job in an architecture firm willing to support their extended path to licensure. Unlike other professions that have defined job training programs such as internships and residencies in medicine, architecture firms are typically for-profit businesses that do not have obligations to sustain staff employment levels during economic downturns. Colleges and universities are much more resilient during trying economic times. We can only hope that architecture professionals continue to remain at full employment levels for the foreseeable future. Otherwise, we will see how much firms are willing to support their emerging professionals. I need to continue to other topics. I hope you'll read our response to the NCARB uh, in the Architects newspaper. Again, we want to be clear that on principle, we support having multiple paths to licensure. 17 jurisdictions already do not require a NAB degree, but we are also concerned about the long-term implications of viewing higher education as an unnecessary barrier to be removed. So I'd like to update you on some of the achievements that we are making this year as part of our 2023-24 strategic priorities. We have three new resources and one new website about to be published in the coming weeks. This year, our research and scholarship committee has two significant products of their work. Their charge this year was to support scholarship related to the intersection of social equity and climate action by helping faculty externalize their research and scholarship. Back in December, we announced the Academy for Public Scholarship on the Built Environment. This is a media training opportunity for faculty. Two kinds of training will be offered. 
The first is a limited opportunity to work with the op-ed project, which is an organization devoted to helping underrepresented experts to take thought leadership positions in their fields through op-eds and more. We will select 12 ACSA members to receive direct training from members of the op-ed project. Costs for the training will be underwritten by ACSA. The second training is a virtual training open to all interested ACSA member faculty. We are working with the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism to provide this training on externalization strategies. More information on this free opportunity will be forthcoming in the spring. The other product from the Research and Scholarship Committee is an update to ACSA's 2017 report, Research and Scholarship for Promotion, Tenure, and Reappointments in Schools of Architecture. The committee worked to update this paper to include additional information about scholarship related to climate justice and racial equity. It will be published in the coming weeks. Here are the members of this year's Research and Scholarship Committee, which is chaired by Jose Abara from the University of Colorado, Denver. Not to be outdone by the Research and Scholarship Committee, I'm happy to report that ACSA will soon be publishing a transfer toolkit to help schools implement best practices for facilitating student transfers from community colleges to four and five-year programs. The Education Committee has worked the last four years to develop an understanding of how community colleges and universities can partner to increase the number of students continuing into architectural education. The content from this document came directly from the event we held last year at Thomas Jefferson University called the Convening to Advance Community College Transfer and Arch Articulation in Architectural Education. Well, that's a mouthful. Which brought together nearly 70 people from 42 uh, colleges and universities. Here are the members of this year's Education Committee, which is co-chaired by Mark Pearson from College of DuPage and Jory Erdman from James Madison University. Mark has been working with ACSA on community college transfer for the last five years, and if you weren't in Vancouver, uh, you missed the special recognition award that we gave to Mark to show his, uh, our gratitude for his service. Kudos to Mark. The third major product from our program committees this year is still in preparation, but is slated to come out by the end of June. It's a resource guide for architecture schools seeking to engage K-12 stakeholders. The Leadership Committee worked hard this year to tackle this increasingly popular and important st strategy for diversifying architecture and for recruiting more students into architecture school. There are numerous national, regional, and local programs in the U.S. and Canada that the committee reviewed in order to understand the landscape of these efforts. From Project Lead the Way to ACE Mentor Program, the committee held sessions at the Administrators Conference and annual meeting to highlight these programs and engage in discussions with our members about engaging the future of architectural education. So be on the lookout for their resource guide, which aims to provide school architecture faculty and administrators with key questions, considerations, and examples about the objective of engagement, whether for the purposes of enhancing admissions or expanding community engagement. Here are the members of the leadership committee chaired by Edson Cabellfin of Tulane University, who is serving his second term on the committee. I wanna turn briefly uh, to review our conferences this year. In October, ACSA and AIA Intersections Research Conference returned to an in-person format on the campus of University of Massachusetts at Amherst. We're grateful to longtime ACSA friends Karen Browse and Steve Schreiber, as well as the many faculty and staff at UMass that hosted us in their beautiful building for material economies. Karen was joined as co-chair by Chris Flint Chatto of uh, ZGF Architects, Together, they put together a conference that took a 360 degree look at issues around architectural building materials, covering areas from material science to supply chains to, to implications for human health. We are currently working on the proceedings for this event in which we hope to publish later this spring. Just a few weeks after the Intersections Conference, we took our administrators to Buffalo where Joyce Wang, Corey Smith, incoming Dean Julia Zerniak, uh, Miguel Guitar and colleagues at the University of Buffalo hosted us on campus where their new buildings was, was recently completed and we were among the first to use it. The conference was titled Expanding Our Impact, which echoes some of the key issues that the organization focused on with our program committees. Sarah Herder, Herda and Maurice Cox opened the conference in conversation about communicating the power of architecture and design 
to improve the quality of life in local communities. Everyone had the opportunity to tour local venues and experience the many ways the university is integrated into the community life in Buffalo. And I want it to be noted, it did not snow. So those of you who are worried about going to Buffalo in November, it didn't happen. We come next to the 112th ACSA annual meeting, which kicked off nearly two weeks ago with a community service project and tour as more than 400 people descended on Vancouver for a long weekend of sunshine. And again, sunshine, people were a little worried about Vancouver and vigorous conversations. Our annual meeting had more than 150 peer reviewed presentations scheduled in addition to more than 20 special sessions, which uh, we take to be another sign that architecture faculty are ready to begin exploring and getting together for scholarly and uh, simply interpersonal exchange. The conference theme was Disruptors on the Edge, and I'm grateful to Blair Satterfield from University of British Columbia for serving on our steering committee, along with Jermaine Barnes from the University of Miami. And I saw Jermaine on here earlier, but thanks to Jermaine and Blair if you're here too. UBC was wonderful host as we took our members to visit the campus for an afternoon of conference sessions and a closing plenary and reception. We closed the conference with a keynote that included AI President Kim Dodal. It's amazing to me to see how large conferences how large conferences come together to create both intense planned interactions as well as spontaneous encounters. I'd also like to thank the members of our reviews committee which is responsible for the high quality peer reviewed content. In the coming weeks, you will find the conference proceedings online in ACSA website's proceedings index. I wanna give a special thanks to Mike Monty and our ACSA staff, Eric Ellis, Michelle Sturgis, Daniel Dent, Kendall Nicholson, Hanifa Jones, Julia McKenzie, Edwin Hernandez, and Uba Chanela, who helped make the conference such a big success. Their efforts behind the scenes, staffing the registration table, engaging in sessions, and more all contribute to a wonderful conference experience for all our members. So if we can give a virtual round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our wonderful staff. What's coming up next? The last conference of the year has yet to take place, but it's one that you'll want to attend. In 2024, uh, the 2024 International Conference is titled Inflections, Becoming What Is Yet to Be. It will be held in Carretero, Mexico. And unfortunately, Louise is not here to give the pitch, but uh, we're working with partnership in partnership with Asenea, which is our counterpart organization in Mexico, and with the host school, Tec de Monterrey, which has a campus in Carretero. Dean Luis Gutierrez, uh, Rico Gutierrez from Iowa State is serving as ACSA's co-chair for this event. And I'm certain he and his co-chairs from Tech de Monterey will be wonderful hosts. Luis grew up in uh, Carretero and went to high school and university on Tech's campus. And I think if you go, you actually might get to meet his parents. So sessions for the conference will be held in English and Spanish. We expect high quality presentations because we had more than 230 abstract submissions, which is the most for an ACSA international conference. And our reviewers are from ACSA and Mexican schools. We will be hosting a pre-conference event in Mexico City starting on the afternoon of June 25th. So mark your calendars and continuing on the 26th to include visits to iconic 20th and 21st century Mexican architecture. There'll be limited number of spaces. So as soon as you see that invitation, make your reservations for that. It did take an act of uh, Mexican Senate to gain access to one of the most emblematic places in Mexican history, the Teatro de la Republica, which is to Mexico, what Independence Hall is to uh, in Philadelphia is to the US. Tatiana Bilbao has agreed to deliver the opening keynote on June 27th. We're also securing some of the most beautiful Baroque patio and loges in the world to organize an urban conference where we'll use the historic city and its patios and squares to talk about the future of the discipline. Finally, there will be a post-conference event on June 30th that we will include visits to natural and landscape sites close to Carretero. Of course, throughout, you'll have great food and great conversations. The peer review process is underway for the conference and we'll be opening up res uh, uh, registration in the coming weeks. To round out my report, I want to make sure that you're aware of more ways for you to get recognition for your scholarship and service work. Of course, we continue to get strong turnout for our annual awards program, but we also have two course prizes that faculty at member schools can apply for. 
first thanks to a partnership with Columbia University's Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture, ACSA has awarded more than $200,000 in funding over the last five years to a range of architecture programs as part of the Course Development Prize in Architecture, Climate Change, and Society. The purpose of the program is to expand the range of approaches for addressing climate change in professional practice by providing funding for the development of novel pedagogies. We announced the 2024 winners in January. In 2022, we added the Timber Prize in partnership with the Softwood Lumber Board. Like the Course Development Prize, the Timber Prize awards $50,000 to schools with innovative courses and curricula that create a stimulating and evidence-based environment for learning about timber. In June, we will announce the winners of the 23-24 Timber Education Prize. Finally, I probably need, don't need to remind you that each year ACSA offers student design competitions that both reward students outstanding work and recognize the faculty that support their development. The American Institute of Steel Construction has been a sponsor of the steel Con competition for more than 20 years. We are sincerely grateful for their continued support of architectural education and are thankful for the continued engagement of faculty in this annual competition. We also wish to recognize the AIA Committee on the Environment for creating the student edition of their own Coat Top 10. Each year, hundreds of students register for this competition and expand their understanding of what architects can do to address climate change. This year, we are also fortunate to see the return of the Timber in the City Design Competition, sponsored by the Softwood Lumber Board and administered by ACSA. Registration is still open for the Timber Competition. This year's challenge asked entrants to select a centrally located building or structure in a busy urban area and develop an innovative wood design solution that adds density through additional floor area via a vertical extension to address the affordability and sustainability crisis that affects our built environment. We're grateful to all our sponsors for their support of architectural education. And in closing for this president's report, I wanna send my thanks to all of ACSA's more than 1200 volunteers who support our peer review committee, task force and other bodies that make ACSA the organization that it is. I'd like to now introduce Kathy Hoshar of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She is ACSA's president elect and we'll talk about next year. Kathy? All right, thank you, Mo. Uh, our program committees are designed to be important mechanisms by which to implement our strategic plan. And as you can see in this slide, the charges for next year's program committees largely build on ongoing work with one committee initiating a slight pivot. The research and scholarship committee will continue to work on advancing scholarship around climate action and social justice by supporting the Academy for Public Scholarship in the built environment with the aim of developing our members' capacity to disseminate the products of their work. The committee will also focus on developing resources and programming to help faculty with identifying funding sources, relationship building with grantors, grant writing, and collaboration. The Education Committee will expand our community college conversation by looking at the continuum of architectural education uh, across community colleges, four-year programs, accredited degree programs through AXP, to examine the role and value of higher education across these different paths. The committee will focus on opportunities for alignment and transparency across these education paths to support informed and future-focused decision-making by students. The leadership committee will pivot slightly from pathways into architecture to focus on mental health and well-being for faculty and students, especially related to equ equity issues and conversations about service and burnout. The committee will examine these issues across faculty types, including lecturers, non-tenure track, tenure, tenure track, and administrative faculty in various roles. In the next couple of weeks, ACSA will publish our call for volunteers for the 2024-2025 year, and we encourage you to review the call and consider applying. Another major activity for the organization next year is strategic planning. As you heard in Mo's presentation, this year we are in the second year of a three-year strategic plan. Uh, the ACSA board will work through its planning committee to engage a wide range of stakeholders in broad discussions about internal and external conditions that will impact our member programs, their students, and more broadly, higher education and architectural practice. We plan to use a variety of means to collect data and member feedback, and we hope that you will participate by responding to a survey or participating in sessions at one of our conferences. Uh, and on our conferences, we have four 
uh, conferences on the books, and we think you'll want to attend every one of them. I'll go in chronological order and surprise you by telling you that the first conference of the 2024-2025 academic year will be the Administrators Conference. So this will be scheduled a week later than usual, partly to get more distance from the presidential election. Uh, we hope that you will join us in Denver at the University of Colorado for the conference, which will be November 14th through 16th. Mark Swackhammer and his team at CU Denver are now conference veterans, having hosted the Acadia Conference there last fall. We will be holding the conference on campus under the theme, The Long View, to collectively confront anti-higher education movements, censorship, enrollment cliffs, budget cuts, and other challenges that are changing the trajectories of our schools. Uh, now, the reason for this surprise, we will be holding an ACSA AI a intersections research conference in the next academic year, except it won't be in the fall. We knew we wanted to hold a conference on the topic of housing, and we knew we wanted to partner with the University of Texas at Austin. But if you know anything about Austin in the fall, it's that there's a lot going on. To start, there's a Formula One race there on one weekend, and there's this thing called college football, which they tell us in Texas is big, like really big. So we quickly realized that it was too difficult to host a conference there in the fall and decided to co-locate this conference with AIAS's annual forum conference. So please, please plan to join us January 9th through the 11th, 2025 in Austin for this educator practitioner event focused on housing. So the Intersections Conference and AIAS programs will be developed separately, but we are finding ways to strategically mix our themes and our audiences for select opportunities for interaction. We are currently working on a call for abstracts, which should be out in a few weeks. Plus, since the conference is almost three months so later, right, we can do it at work work. Work. So we can you do should it have more like time to get your abstracts stuff. ready. Uh, and then a couple of weeks ago in Vancouver, we were happy to announce our plans for the 113th annual meeting, which will take place March 20th through 22nd in New Orleans. Tulane University will be our host, and they've told us that by this time, crossing our fingers, their building will be complete. The conference theme is repair, uh, reflecting the many ways that architecture schools help build, rebuild, heal, and empower our communities. The theme connects our conversation to the city, to the people, land, and the history of New Orleans uh, to ground our convening in its place. Uh, one of the things I appreciated about this year's annual meeting was that there were concentrations of, of sessions on topics like community design and AI. Uh, this meant that groups of educators decided to come together to find ways to collaborate and support each other. Uh, and we want to continue this in 2025 and encourage you to start thinking of ways to propose special sessions that help draw out the many different communities of practice that connect our schools and our work. We will be collaborating with an array of faculty and centers to make this a memorable and place-based experience. So please be sure to mark the deadline for abstracts and special session proposals, which is June 12th, 2024. Last, I wanna tell you about the 2025 Teachers Conference. We hold this conference jointly with the European Association for Architectural Education in odd number of years. We alternate continent, continents each time we hold the conference. So in 2025, uh, it's our turn to host. We're fortunate to be working with the Faculty of Architecture at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's been nearly a decade since ACSA has held a conference in this beautiful city, and we're excited to return. Michael Fachev and Roger Mullen from Dalhousie Housey will serve as our co-chairs to develop a conference program themed conflict, colon, resolution, using a bit of punctuation to draw into question the relationship between these two terms. I learned recently that Roger Mullen has been working with the host of the 2023 Teachers Conference, Massimo Santanakia, from the University of the Arts in Iceland. And that conference was a tremendous success, and we look forward to building on that success 15 months from now. We are finalizing our call for abstracts for that conference, so please be on the lookout for multiple ways to get your work published and connect with new and old friends to address our agency in the context of university, community, and geopolitical conflicts and reconciliation. And now I would like to introduce Peter Robinson, who will do or give our secretary treasurer's report.
Good evening. I'm sharing our ACSA statement of financial position for uh, fiscal year ending August 31, 2023. Looking at our assets, which considers cash, investments, accounts receivable, interest receivable, prepaid expenses, property and equipment, our total assets total 3,231,408. Considering for liabilities, our total net asset total 2,664,547. Moving on to our summary of activities for FY23. This is a unique ad this year um, for clarity. Our revenues, which include membership, conferences, sponsored activity, publications, and our miscellaneous and investment income, our total revenue for FY23 totaled 2,960,837. Considering for expenses, which include membership, NAB and accreditation support, conferences, sponsored activities, publications, our board, management, general, and technology, our total expenses total 2,701,816. Our net operating income, considering losses, 186,198. For clarity, we've pulled out our, our one-time expenses, which include our community college convening, our annual meeting and travel grants, our JAE fellow stipend, our ACSA faculty fellowship, and uh, equipment and training for faculty. Our total one-time strategic expenses total $116,291. There is a change in our net asset total expenses, which equals 69907 Moving on to our projected net asset and balances as of August 31, 2023. Our operating revenue projected balance is $1,242,979. Considering furniture, equipment, and technology, our balance is at 79525525 Our strategic initiative funds projected balance is equivalent to 1,300,287 for a total of 2,622,791. Considering um, our donor restrictions, which is a JAE, um, it's that equal to 30,000, which gives our total projected balance for FY 2023 as of August, 2,652,791. I'm confirming now that we are at quorum and moving on to other business. Thank you. Thanks, Peter, for that report. And before we move on to our two items of uh, other business, I wanna mention again that if members have any new business to please message Mike Monty in the chat. Um, for other business we have, updates from the executive director editors of two journals as well as an equity and social and equity and justice update from Kendall Nicholson. I'd like to introduce uh, Elise Newman from the Technology Architecture and Design Journal Report. Thanks, Mel. So TAD is uh, the peer-reviewed international journal dedicated to the advancement of scholarship in the field of building technology and its translation, integration, and impact on architecture and design. That has been our mission from the beginning and continues to be so today. We aim to become an essential source for new knowledge about how we think, make, and use technology within the building arts. Um, intended for researchers, educators, and practitioners, we do advance and transform the current discourse on building-based technologies with the goal of expanding, reimagining, and challenging its role in architecture and design. Our 2023-24 editorial board members are shown here. We are currently 12 members. We have recently uh, uh, 
completed a search in which we've extended to three new board members. I'm not including those names as we are in the process of reaching out to those people to confirm um, and welcome them to the board. As you will see, our board membership stretches um, in, in fact, quite far and wide as far as Madrid, Sweden, and then uh, across the continental United States. We are now in TAD volume 79. This is year six of TAD. We began in 2017. I'm not showing all the previous volumes, but I wanted to point out the last four issues, which is volumes, the end of volume seven, and then volume eight complete, and then the first issue in volume nine. The call for volume nine is out now. We're in the process of working through the peer review for coding, and we are soon to complete the final proof for climate. At any given time, we have three issues in process. This articulates the roles that are played on the, the various issues. Are, we have an active board, all 15 members of the board, 12 this past Past year serve in various roles for each issue. We have several roles, though, that bridge issues. Our communications editor, which was a new role, our associate editor with a focus on the design who manages the um, figures and the captions that belong to, that coordinates basically the visual part of our um, um, journal, and then my, the role that I have, which is the executive editor. Oh, there we go. Uh, this last year, we opened a TAD Instagram account. In part, this was due to the fact that we have are now a communications editor, and we've been able to work with the ACSA um, media team to expand our media impact, basically, for the journal. We've included, I'm showing you some stills from our TAD Instagram page. We're also now doing TAD Instagram Reels, in which we're having issue editors um, and potentially other uh, authors discuss their work. Um, we are also increased the number of uh, things that we're including on our TAD website. We, of course, had news. Our TAD award is now being shown. We have videos which are prepared by authors or people whose work we find interesting, and then also sort of self-help things having to do with, say, 3D modeling. If you, It's really um, beginning to build up now the number of things that are shown on the website. I encourage you to take a look and see the things that we're developing. There we go. The TAD Award, we were able to offer two awards. This was um, at, we uh, made this request of the board and were granted permission to do that. We're very happy about that. Very grateful to the ACSA Executive Committee and the board for uh, enabling us to do this. We were we we're receiving over the last three, four years, we've increased the number of peer review um, um, articles in the journal, and we felt that it was time to begin to award more than one. So we picked the two best from volume six, and we were able to give those the TAD award. That was done at the just recently in our annual um, conference. Uh, we also had two, a special focus session. We do this at every ACSA annual conference. These really allow our authors to talk about the work that they're doing, but also to share their experience with TAD. I wanted to show you this because if you'll notice, it's one on the first one is the, this was an author that evaluated the review that they got. The first was the original submission. This is a round two submission. They actually submitted their work three or four times to the journal before it was published. Each time receiving better and better marks in each area. They felt that this process was very helpful in developing not only better um, publication, but actually helping them to shape the direction of the work and help them understand the requirements for publishing in a high impact journal. So we've also developed this year a set of AI guidelines. I don't know if you've all come across this in your own academic experience, but this is on the increase. We're seeing it both in text and image. So we have determined to be proactive about this and developed a checklist and a disclosure statement that we're going to require for all submissions. We're working with ACSA and with the publisher in order to be able to um, get this online. I just want to share a few of our metrics, our article downloads. 
They had increased from 19% from 2022 to 2023. They've actually increased 34% from 23 to 24. We recently got our updated publisher's report. Um, you can see that we're spread across a number of countries and regions, still quite heavily in Europe and North America, but increasing in Asia. We hope to increase in Africa and Latin America as we move forward. Um, our published content, basically, uh, most downloaded articles the past 12 months had open access. This is something that's going to be on the forefront as we move forward dealing with um, publication in general. So this is going to affect all journals as we move forward. Um, you can definitely see that there's an increase in the number of downloads when an article has open access. We've increased the number of research articles pretty significantly. We're now averaging 10 to 11 per issue. Um, that's really where we wanted to be. That means that our peer review content in each journal is now comprised um, about 20, about 75% of the journal. Um, our published content, basically, uh, most downloaded articles the past 12 months had open access. This is something that's going to be on the forefront as we move forward dealing with with, um, publication in general. So this is going to affect all journals as we move forward. Um, you can definitely see that there's an increase in the number of downloads when an article has open access. We've increased the number of research articles pretty significantly. We're now averaging 10 to 11 per issue. Um, that's really where we wanted to be. That means that our peer review content in each journal is now comprised um, about 20, about 75% of the journal. Our non-peer reviewed, that's our solicited pieces, are about 25% of the journal, and our peer reviewed is about 20, 75%. Okay, finally, we're very happy about this. Our site score was projected to be 1.4. It's currently 1.3. These are the number of citations that you see in a journal. Site score is really important in terms of the role that the journal plays in promotions um, and tenure and promotion for most of our audience, basically, who are primarily academics, although we do have now increasing impact in industry. But that citation score is often one of the, is now being asked by many um, universities to be included um, along with it, information about publication, the publication that you're submitting for tenure and review or for promotion. So we're very pleased that we're seeing that go up. Taylor and Francis, our public publisher, pointed out that we also had two policy mentions. This is actually really significant. Policy mentions mean that the work has an increased impact over just normal citations. So we were very happy to um, see that this is just continuing to go up. And for a six, a journal that's been basically in publication for six years, this is the the publisher has reassured us that this is a nice um, amount of growth that they're seeing. Implemented for 2023-24, we increased peer review. We did do that. We increased the number of manuscripts in the pipeline. We're now open submission, rolling submission, and we're seeing people take advantage of that slowly, um, but surely. We had, we're working on the continued outreach and communication for that. We started our Instagram account, developed videos and video and reels and Facebook um, promotions, worked to educate the authors about the importance of promoting their work. Um, this is being shared sharing it in order to increase the alt metrics for the journal. Designed and produced had pins. We um, continued with our special sessions, our work sessions for authors. Um, we have developed and voted on new terms for our advisory board internally. We'll be applying, we'll be approaching the ACSA board for their review and confirmation of that process, and which we hope then to proceed with a candidate search in the coming year. In terms of operations, we're continuing to streamline our storage. We're now writing service letters, which are produced by the ACSA executive committee. Um, and then signed and sent to um, members of the board who have served in various capacities, important recognition for their efforts with the journal. Um, we do have our new AI chat GPT guidelines, and we did complete a successful search for three candidates. In the future, as we move forward, we plan to maintain our peer review, include that 
chat, uh, our AI policy on the journal website, um, basically address issues with open access. This is coming at a cost, as you know, if you have published in the past couple of years, increasingly journals um, are requesting or that um, publishers are requesting that authors pay for um, the work that is being published. It hasn't hit us quite as directly as it has um, other STEM disciplines, but it is coming and we need to look at what that's going to be. Basically, we're continuing to increase our outreach and promotion. We're going to develop measures with that for that with Taylor and Francis. They do do alt metrics, but we'd like to understand some of the other um, impacts that might be possible. Increasing our efforts um, in that area is really important. We're going to also explore additional online content, maybe special issues, um, develop links to conference and other materials on the on our website do a candidate search for our advisory board, continue to streamline our process, our review process. We are double blind peer reviewed, and this is something that takes a fair amount of effort. Update all of our style sheets and author guides. Um, it's a good time to do that every three to four years. It's time to do it again. Continue to streamline archiving, and then basically um, update some processes with Scholar One um, in order to capture some additional information and perhaps um, streamline some of the peer review process for our external peer reviewers. Thank you to um, all of the ACSA leadership, of course, for your support um, through all of this and, and your um, help, basically, in making sure that this journal is receiving the best possible um, attention and support it can. Of course, Mike Monty, Daniel, Dan Danielle, Julia, Michelle, and Eric, who directly um, work with us, but actually all the ACSA a staff plays an important role um, in the public and ultimately helping us get the journal published. And then finally, um, to all of the board members who labor quite intensely in order to make sure that the quality of the journal remains high and that we continue to have an impact on our um, discipline. Thank you so much. Thanks, Elise. Much appreciated. Uh, I want to introduce Nora Wendell, executive editor for the Journal of Architectural Education, for her report. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for thank you, Elise. It was it was great to get insight into TAD, and um, thank you all for the time today. Um, I'm really happy to present what the J has been up to this past year. So, if you're not familiar. I hope you are. Um, the J is a double-blind, peer-reviewed international journal published by the ACSA, and it's been the primary venue for research on architectural education since 1947. We are a platform for architectural educators, scholars, designers, writers, and organizers committed to the ongoing transformation of architectural education and the culture of architectural research toward an inclusive, just, and sustainable future. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to the JE Editorial Board first. There are 22 of us in total. Um, we're a diverse collection, thank you, of perspectives and ranks within academia from untenured to full professor, which has been a really important part of um, the Editorial Board. It provides mentorship, but also various perspectives from different ranks in academia. And we are a working Editorial Board, just like uh, Elise was saying, same situation where we collaborate on everything from the peer review process to policies, to working with JA fellows. And it really is the editorial board's commitment to the journal that keeps it moving. So I really want to acknowledge your support at member schools to send your, uh, your faculty to the editorial board meetings, keep them involved in this process, it means a lot. Um, and the design editor, Ozer Salucci, and reviews editor, David Theodore, who are also very, very pivotal to this whole organization. Um, first, uh, the Infidelities issue was just published online, organized by theme editors Aya Musmar, Nishat Awan, Mena Aga, and Ozer Salucci during an incredibly difficult time. The cover art is by MacArthur fellow Shazia Sikander, who contributed many pieces throughout the issue. And this should be arriving in your mailboxes soon. We had a paper shortage. Um, on the Taylor and Francis side, but it is online if you'd like to take a look at it. Just to get a preview of it, the table of contents is organized thematically. And you'll see it if I get any. All right. Is organized thematically, intermingling interviews, essays, design essays, narratives, and solicited pieces from authors. Interviews include a conversation with Yara Sharif, who interrogates the relationship between politics and architecture. Um, an essay by Jilly Tragana, which focuses on what the author calls the interdependence of bodies, materiality, and democracy. 
Next, a photo essay on a school in Karachi, Pakistan, founded by two artists. Next, a narrative in which the author, Tabby Gaber, reflects on her B. Arc thesis design for a mosque from 25 years ago, an, an interesting piece that reflects in the present and the past project. Um, next, we have a piece by Sophie Juno on a design build project organized at the University of Miami School of Architecture in protest to Florida law HB 999, which is widely known as the Don't Say Gay Law. And next, a visual contribution from artist Shazia Sikander. They're all the way through the issue. They're really pretty phenomenal. As well as next, um, pieces by Murat Palta, whose mono prints in the style of the Persian miniature take up contemporary cultural icons like Barbenheimer. So a lot of these pieces are working with sort of contemporary questions of infidelity um, to, you know, profession, to imagery, et cetera. Um, we worked a lot on our past editorial board meeting in Vancouver and also celebrated the end of our review editor's second term. Um, David Theodore has contributed so much as reviews editor since 2019, and it's been hard to say goodbye to him, but we'll be announcing a new reviews editor soon. Um, if you see David, tell him congratulations, and you will be reading, I'm sure, many of the reviews that his committee has completed in the past, I think in the past four months, they've finished up 15 reviews that are lined up to go online. Um, next, we also celebrated our award winners for the past year. So congratulations to JAE essay award winner Danica Cooper for her piece, Spatializing Reparations, Mapping Reparative Futures. The JAE narrative award winner, Jordan Whitewood Neal for his piece, Worship the Lift Engineer. The JAE design award winners, Jesse Vogler, Ken Botnick, and Alyssa Blatter for attending to and building the One Tree Project. Next, and in our spring meeting, we worked through the peer review process for the design work in our next issue, Worlding Energy Transitions, theme edited by Billy Fleming and Rania Gozen, which will be out in the fall of 2024. And next, we held a theme editors forum at the spring meeting. I hope you were able to attend that, um, including a presentation by theme editors for the issue following Worlding, which is Architecture Beyond Extraction, which is theme edited by Niraj Bhatia, Jane Hutton, Zana Matson and Brittany Uting, who are bringing this issue together and accepting manuscripts through August 2nd. So consider that as you're teaching courses or doing research or anything related to topics uh, uh, around extraction. Um, we hope to get a lot of submissions for that. We published our first two pieces by JAE Fellows online. So an excellent essay by Bees Shang and a wonderful interview by Deli Adeyemo, um, Jennifer Newsom, and Jerome Hayford. So you can go to JAE online and read these. We're really excited about them. They're beautiful essays and a beautiful interview. And we have four fellows who are in the middle of their projects and will be publishing in the fall. The first is Althea Peacock, who's a founding partner and co-director of Lemon Pebble Architects, a Johannesburg-based practice. Her project will explore the idea of home and focuses on the absent archives of a post-apartheid township in Johannesburg called Westbury. Um, Albert Chow, a second fellow, is a licensed architect, artist, and educator based in New York. His project focuses on the work of Robert Trainum Coles, a Black architect who opened his practice in Buffalo in 1963. And in this project, Chow expands on the legacy of Coles' activism and grapples with ongoing structural issues in the community. Our third fellow, Aya Musmar, teaches at the University of Petra in Amman. Her project investigates the spatial and sociocultural environment of a Syrian refugee camp. And fourth, uh, Mohammed Nala teaches at MIT and his project as a JA fellow, Design After Dark, studies the transformation of the night in the Middle East following the expansion of colonization in the region over centuries. So look for the projects online in the fall. We're working closely with them. I would like to say thank you to the Graham Foundation and the ACSA for funding JA fellows for three years. It's been an incredible process for us, and we've had our first round of fellows rejoin now as advocates to be mentors to the third round of fellows, which we will be um, sorting through and, and having them vote on. We have 54 applicants to look at in the next uh, few weeks and, and decide on. Um, if you are interested in funding JA fellows, please reach out to me. We are strategizing how to continue funding this project so that we don't see it um, disappear with the, with the end of funding from the Graham Foundation and ACSA. So if you are interested in supporting or have some ideas about fundraising for it, please reach out. We would love to have a conversation. Um, and then just a few uh, statistics from our publisher, Taylor and Francis. Uh, we have had a 14% increase in downloads so far this year, which we're excited about. If you go to the next slide, what you notice from the downloads is that we do see 
a percentage from Taylor and Francis, but most of the downloads are actually from JSTOR, which I think is a really important um, reminder of why we get indexed and why that really matters and, and how people in the universities access if they don't have a membership. Um, next, uh, this chart indicates which journals are likely to cite the JE, which is perhaps best understood in the next slide, which shows that the, uh, the journals likely to cite JE are Landscape Research, the International Journal of Architectural Research, Sustainability, and so on. Um, in the next slide, I, I was excited that our site score had doubled in the past year until I saw Tad's site score, but I want to point out that this is what we're calling sustainable growth because we started with a 0.1 in 2018 and we're at a 0.6 in 2023. So we're hoping that that just continues to increase because as, um, as Elise was saying, this is an important way to see the impact of the journal. However, one impact that we see that's that's quite large is actually our altmetric score, which tracks the attention that our articles receive online from social media and other media sources. Um, these make articles more visible and brings people through, you know, X or Facebook or a blog or you know a news article to the Taylor and Francis website. So we found um, our greatest. Uh, impact piece was an interview with Leslie Loco called This is for Everyone, published in Pedagogies for a Broken World. It was performing in the top 5% of all research scored by altmetrics. So we were really excited to know that um, while we're still developing our site score, which has been increasingly exponentially going up every year, we're excited to see that the altmetrics are reaching audiences um, in sort of new and innovative ways. Um, and then in our last two slides, oh, these are, sorry, breakdown of altmetric attention. So news mentions, blog, X, Wikipedia, et cetera. Um, and then what you'll see in the next slide is that we are having a higher number of submissions, which we're excited about. We've seen a lot of growth um, compared to the two years prior. So in 2023, we had a sort of burst of submissions. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for submitting to the, the JE. We're excited that our calls are um, resonating with audiences. Um, and of course, with higher submissions, we are seeing a lower acceptance rate. So we are currently at 10% acceptance. So just to keep in mind that with higher submissions, which we're excited about, we do see a lower acceptance rate because we have limits on what we're able to publish. Um, but altogether, it's been a wonderful year. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody at ACSA for making this work possible. We would not be able to produce this journal without your support and leadership. And everybody at ACSA has been uh, very encouraging, really important um, in developing all the phases of the journal from the production of it to the strategizing. So I really have to say thank you to everybody at ACSA for making it an excellent year. And that is it, thank you. All right, thanks Nora, much appreciated. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Kendall Nicholson, Senior Director of Research Equity and Education for uh, Equity and Justice Update. Hello everyone. <clears throat> Um, I am going to talk really briefly just about uh, two equity initiatives, one being a web page and one being a website. Uh, the first one is uh, the ACSA shift to social justice, um, which is seen just a screen, a screen uh, grab there. Um, and the purpose of this website is to acknowledge the imperative for us to shift our focus from diversity to social and ecological justice. Um, and that's from an organizational standpoint. So, um, and, and this is clear, clearly defined in, on the site, which will be, be published in the next week. But um, for the past decade, ACSA has strived to engage a more diverse population of faculty, administrators, and professionals. Um, and we've had some successes. We've also had some gaffes. <laughs> Um, but we've remained focused on extending our reach. Near the end of 2017, we found ourselves repeating the same strategies with minimal impact. Um, and in 2019, we made a commitment to look less at cultural competency, diversity, and implicit bias, and more at equity and justice. Um, and so the policies, programs, and procedures that you'll see See listed on the website. It's essentially a, an extended timeline that goes back 10 years, um, is really us trying to be accountable to ourselves and to measure um, from where we've come and where we're headed. Um, I, Mo and Nora and others have made, um, you know, many statements on this call already about some of the, the justice-related content and activities that and initiatives that we've been doing. Um, 
so I'm just here to double down on that. Um, the and then additionally, I'll just note. I mean, it obviously differs for everyone, depending on your context. Um, but in the face of mounting attacks against academic freedom, race-blind admissions, and legislature censoring content on race and gender, we are hoping as ACSA that we can be the place to tackle the hard topics uh, in the name of a just future, because realistically, everyone and everything is a stakeholder in the built environment, right? Um, the second page or, or site um, is an ACSA justice site. So in August of last year, ACSA awarded its first faculty fellowship to advance equity in architecture uh, to Cruz Garcia and Natalie Frankowski. And they've been working on a website that we're calling ACSA Justice in Architecture, which provides resources, references, and scholarship on equity social and ecological justice in architecture. Um, so really these this web page and this website uh, work in tandem. Uh, so major shout out to them. Um, in addition to sharing the recordings from their work in the past two semesters, uh, the from lamb grab to lamb back, um, we or they, excuse me, have also worked with Taylor and Francis to ensure that the articles in the JAE and TAD that deal with justice and injustice are open access and can be found through the site. Um, so once the site is launched, you'll be able to go to it essentially acts as a one-stop shop where you're able to see all the work in not only the JAE, uh, you know, recently here, um, but TAD. Um, in addition, it... Um, also, they also connected with Emergent Ground for design education um, and gathered the hundreds of uh, or hundred plus letters and statements that um, alumni and students and faculty commissioned uh, in the wake of the racial reckoning in 2020. Um, I really could go on. I mean, the site also includes access to international architectural organizations dealing with questions of equity, social justice, ecological justice, like Dark Matter University, design is protest, loud readers. Um, and so I'll leave it there, but both websites should be made public in the coming week. Um, and I will make sure that it's in everyone's inbox in the, in the next week or so. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, Kendall, for that report. Uh, I actually want to call on Julia Andor from AIS uh, to report on uh, learning, learning and teaching culture. Julia? Hello, hello. Thank you so much, Mal. And I think I'm able to share my screen, which is perfect. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Mo and the team at ACSA for this opportunity to chat with you all today about this uh, topic that's been really near and dear to my heart lately. And I think um, the AIS and the ACSA have been really um, strong collaborators on kind of raising these discussions to the forefront. So today we're going to be, I'm going to just chat really quickly with you all about learning and teaching and what that means for our cultures in architecture school. There we go. So hello, everybody. Uh, I was introduced earlier. I'm the student representative on the ACSA board, the 67th vice president of the American Institute of Architecture students, a graduate of the New York Institute of Technology. So if you have any interest in reaching out to me after this to chat more, my email is vicepresident at AIS.org. Um, so really briefly, I'll just touch on what is the AIS, if you don't know, the American Institute of Architecture Students. We're an independent nonprofit uh, student-run organization dedicated to advancing leadership, design, and service in many architecture students. And we do this to create a more sustainable, healthy, and equitable future. You can kind of see the overlaps between the mission of the ACSA. We do this because we believe that students are the future. So we want to empower student voices, ideas, and actions, as I know many of you do as well. So AIS is an international organization with over 4,000 student members, 350 chapters, and a whole range of uh, schools all across the world. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. I'm here to talk to you about uh, learning and teaching culture and how, you know, um, faculty administrators and students can all work together to um, start to make change in our schools. So I know that you're all familiar uh, with the NAB Conditions for Accreditation, or you're most likely familiar. Um, learning and teaching culture is defined in the Conditions for Accreditation uh, as how the program fosters and ensures a positive and respectful environment that encourages optimism, respect, sharing, engagement, and innovation 
among faculty, students, administration, and staff. Um, so kind of the main takeaway from that is that learning and teaching culture is meant to foster healthy cultures for everyone involved in architectural education, not just students, not just professors, but it's kind of an ongoing discussion that we all have together. Um, and I also just want to make a quick distinction between learning and teaching culture and learning and teaching culture policy. You may know that the AIS has a learning and teaching culture policy model document that you can use um, at your schools to help with NAV accreditation, but that's not its only purpose, and I'm going to touch on that as well. Um, but we have a model document that you can use to start to outline what a policy looks like, but a learning and teaching culture and a healthy culture would ideally be the, the outcome of setting up a document like that. It would be changed practices and learned practices um, and healthier kind of uh, ways we move through architectural education. So I wanted to take a minute to just talk about what learning and teaching culture is not. Uh, learning and teaching culture is not a replacement for mental health care for students and faculty. That's something we think is uh, super important to call out, uh, although they are large parts of learning and teaching culture. Uh, the model document will not necessarily uh, replace those uh, really important uh, resources for students and faculty. Learning and teaching culture policy is not only a condition for NAB accreditation, I've already mentioned NAB a few times, but um, uh, schools that do not have a NAB accredited, pro uh, accredited program can also have a learning and teaching culture policy in the interest of um, healthier cultures. Uh, and it is not only for NAB accredited schools, so I'll uh, that's kind of a little bit of a back and forth, but um, in NAB accredited schools, we also don't want the policy to only be a part of accreditation. It should be kind of an ongoing discussion with other purposes. Um, learning and teaching culture policy is not a set of rules for one group to control another. This is something um, that I think students especially want to share is that we're not looking to impose a set of rules on our professors or administrators. We really do want learning and teaching culture to be a discussion for that kind of changes times, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. The learning and teaching culture is not only about physical space maintenance that so we see um, a lot of the time that uh, the policy can kind of be watered down to, you know, unpin your drawings at the end of class or make sure that, you know, there's no sharp objects around in the studio. So while uh, space stewardship is a part of learning and teaching culture, it's not the whole picture. And that's something we want to call it as well. Learning and teaching culture policy is also not studio culture policy. Learning and teaching culture was um, previously known as studio culture policy, and I'm going to talk really briefly about the history of studio culture and learning and teaching culture, but just something to note that it is no longer called studio culture policy. And this is generally because we think healthy practices should be practiced in every class, not just studio, and learning and teaching also implies this back and forth of a discussion between students and faculty, which um, I was just talking about. So both learning and teaching are about having tough conversations and navigating important subjects. I think that's something we can all agree on. Um, it's also about bringing people to the table as equals as opposed to falling into hierarchies, which is a word we talk about a lot in architecture. So I'll encourage you all to think, what is the paradigm of architecture school? You know, something that might come to mind, we've done a lot of like uh, surveys about this is, you know, coffee, pulling all-nighters, um, skipping meals potentially, but then there's also things like collaboration and creativity. So it's kind of a back and forth, but something that we're kind of generally looking for is healthier practices. Um, so just to touch on this a little bit, the first AIS Studio Culture Task Force was created in the year 2000, following the death of a student who was driving home after pulling multiple all-nighters for their studio final review. So in, uh, 2002, the AIS published the redesign of studio culture, noting changes needed to produce healthier, more optimistic, and engaging architecture school graduates. Um, we held the Studio Culture Summit in 2004 and subsequently published the Studio Culture Summit a report. I'm not going to go through too much here, but this is a list of things from this summit that should be kept about architecture school, things we should maintain, critical thinking, one-on-one -on -one student faculty, integration, um, presentation, and explanation of why are just some examples that you can see them. And then here were some of the things that we uh, that from the summit thought needed to change: adversarial relationships, all-nighters, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, so the AIS task force on studio culture published toward an evolution of studio culture in 2008 to reassess this impact and uh, investigate, you know, what wasn't working as well as we might think. And then uh, in 2019, the uh, Steering committee successfully lobbied to redefine studio culture as learning and teaching culture, all the reasons that I mentioned before, but to better encompass the scope and goal. 
So in 2020, we did model policy, uh, touching on learning and teaching culture, from which architecture and design schools can adopt borrow. You can find that on our website, but there will be an updated version coming in the, the next few weeks. And now we continue having discussions regarding the implementation of learning and teaching culture. We have the policy, we are having all these good discussions. Now what, how do we really get this to take hold? So that's kind of the question I have for you all, not to answer now, but to think about, um, as well as how it correlates to professional settings and labor issues. Um, so just as something to note, we asked our chapter president at the AIS COP, do you have a learning and teaching culture document at your school? 31% um, said yes, 50% said they're not sure, and 14% said no. So while I know that many of you do, do have a document, uh, it may not be that the students know about it. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we also asked chapter presidents at the COP, did your chapter participate in the process of creating or implementing learning teaching culture policy at your school? Only 14% said yes. So this is another kind of thing I, I would encourage you all to do and to, to think about is encouraging, um, is including students in this process as well. So I uh, take this to say, how can we frame this conversation as a paradigm shift? How can we start to change the way we think about architectural education? And I know a lot of you are doing that kind of work already. And I'll encourage you to think about what really drives culture. Is it policy? While it's very important, there are other things, um, including our practices, that have a lot to do with that. I have a few questions listed here. I'm not going to uh, ask you guys all of them, but um, some of the answers to these questions can start to come out when you think about what was your time in school like and what has changed and what hasn't um, to this point. What is something really positive that's going on at your school or something maybe that your school could aspire to do? Um, what would uh, help implementing a better culture or um, a better culture policy? And what can learning and teaching culture initiatives do for you and your program? So think maybe uh, better retention rates, better outcomes of projects and, and healthier and happier students. Um, and I'll leave you by just saying that learning and teaching culture is for everyone. It's supposed to make you know professor and administrator lives better. It's supposed to make studio uh, students lives better. Uh, and it's for all of us to work collectively on. So I'll encourage you to keep an eye out for the updated model policy in the next few weeks and to just start to have these conversations. Thanks so much, guys, for your time. Thanks, Julia. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to see if April Ward was here. She had, uh, wanted to bring up an issue. Oh, I'm here. Oh, great, April. I just... um. um it was really more just a response to some of the things that you were presenting and um yeah i just wanted to share a perspective i guess yeah please go ahead um yeah it just i thought um you were mentioning something about sort of handicapping um being careful not to handicap the the um legitimacy of the academic programs and the path towards licensure, I guess. I kind of took it that way. And I I teach at an HBCU and I just wanted to share that, um, you know, a good majority of my students express um, that they do want to become faculty and that that would be their desired path um, to practice and in the profession. And so I think um, I just wanted to kind of amplify their voice a little bit on that. And, and for those of you, you know, thinking and, and writing about these things, um, you know, don't forget about them. And, and um, you know, I think for equity in the profession, that's going to be really needed that, um, you know, that there are pathways for my students uh, to become faculty and teach and um, conduct research. <laughs> they, uh, thanks April for sharing that perspective and, and kind of re-centering re that conversation or our conversation on, on the importance of our students um, and, and making sure that we're thinking about them in, in the whole of the continuum. So I did wanna, uh, give everyone an opportunity. Uh, we're sort of at the final stages. We have one more section. Uh, we have some memorials that we'd like to share, but before we do that, I wanted to see if there are any other uh, questions or comments about what people have heard or seen tonight. Um, 
under our new business section. And I guess if you had something, maybe if you want to raise your hand or. Okay. Not seeing or hearing anything. So I'd like to, before we adjourn today, I do want to take a moment to memorialize some of our faculty members we lost over the last year. Uh, we invited schools to submit their memorials and the following slides reflect um, what information we did receive. We realized that not all members uh, who have passed away will be included here. And if you, we welcome you to paste any names or links in the chat um, to in addition to, so that we can uh, honor them. And we'll just do this as a moment of silence as we scroll through the names. to um, thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank you for being members of ACSA. Please reach out to us if you have questions or comments or want to share. We have a lot of important issues that we've discussed tonight and a lot of things that are facing our discipline, and uh, we, we will continue those conversations over the ne next months and years. So thank you all and have a great evening.